In the past year, we've seen plenty of division in our culture, from politics to protests to a pandemic and beyond. Everyone has an opinion. In a world bent on dividing us, let's rediscover the truth of our unity in Christ and our supreme call to love one another as brothers and sisters, even as Christ has loved us. It's a life of supernatural power that cannot be defeated. A divine purpose higher than anything this world can offer. When everything in a fallen world is typically all about me, the antidote is a radical devotion to Jesus and one another. Well, hello, Valley Church at home. Welcome to our online broadcast. And not only is this our online broadcast, but I want to welcome those in our traditional venue as well. We love you and we are excited that you're here. We are in part five today of our series, One Another, where we are exploring some of the most amazing one another passages in the New Testament. And just to remind you, uh, over the first four weeks, we've talked deeply about loving one another from John 13. Uh, Pastor Ben Daly was here a few weeks ago, talked about forgiving one another. We talked about serving one another from Galatians 5. And last weekend, accepting one another when we talked about racial reconciliation. And this weekend, we are turning to 1 Thessalonians. If you want to start heading there, 1 Thessalonians looking at a passage that could be more relevant now than at any time in our generation. Again, we're in the book of 1 Thessalonians. It's a letter written uh, in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul. And Paul is writing this letter to a group of Christians who are living under severe persecution. Their lives and their freedoms are constantly under assault, along with the fact that many false teachers have crept in among them, trying to lure them away from the gospel that Paul taught them. And Paul had planted this church only about four months before he wrote this letter. And so he sends Timothy back to the church to get a report on how things are going. And in spite of the onslaught of persecution and the false teaching creeping in, Timothy comes back and he's pleased to report that they are standing strong in their young faith. Now, if anyone who, uh, uh, if anyone knows anything about the Apostle Paul, he was not um, he, was, he was not a novice when it came to experiencing persecution. In fact, he knew about it from both sides of the equation. Remember, Paul himself was once a persecutor. He was the one bringing the persecution, responsible for the harassment and the imprisonment and even often the death, the murder of some of Christ's early followers around Jerusalem and, and during the first few years of the church's existence. But then Paul, he has this miraculous conversion experience where the risen Christ appears to him on the Damascus road and he changes his name from Saul to Paul. But even more importantly than changing his name, Jesus changed Paul's very nature from a hater of Jesus into the greatest proclaimer of Jesus probably who has ever lived. And of course, the, the, the moment Paul switches teams the moment he goes from hating Jesus to proclaiming Jesus, what happens? Well, he himself goes on the opposite side of the persecution. He begins receiving persecution from every angle. The Jews hated Paul, of course, because they saw him as a traitor. Uh, they, they, they thought that he had just sort of left them to join this little cult of Jesus people. And of course, the Romans hated Paul because they saw any worship of Jesus as a threat to the quote-unquote lordship of Caesar. And so Paul understands persecution probably more than the average dude at you know at, you could pick anyone from any generation Paul is going to rival uh, whatever anybody's gone through in terms of persecution Paul is right up there at the top of the list and he wants these young Christians in Thessalonica to learn like he was doing to stand strong in the face of tyranny and to trust Jesus through it all and it's interesting that Paul anchors this letter in the reality that Jesus Christ is coming again in the future and it may be sooner than we think by the way and he's going to come to establish the only 
only perfect kingdom that the world has ever seen. It's a day when evil will finally be judged and all things will be laid bare and those who know Christ will be called to rule and reign with him in this new, what we call the millennial kingdom. In fact, this past summer, I led a 10-week series called Kingdom Come, where we looked at a lot of the details of Christ's return. And that series, in fact, is available on our app and at valleychurch.com uh, if you'd like to go back and give that a listen. But for today, I want us to focus in on chapter 5, verse 11 in 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to read it now, and then we're going to talk about how we might apply it right now in this world in which we live. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another... And build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. So today, we look at the reality of encouraging each other. The English verb to encourage is a very powerful concept. It's, it's a compound word that means to build courage into somebody. The original language of the, of the New Testament, of course, is Greek, and its Greek word is, a, is the word paraclete or parakletos, which is a word that Jesus actually used to describe the Holy Spirit. And paraclete means to come alongside in order to bring help or comfort or assistance. So the phrase encourage one another has many layers of deep meaning and uh, to build courage into someone, to come alongside of someone in order to bring help or comfort or assurance is perhaps, as I said, needed now more than ever before in our generation. You know, I've seen God move in some incredible ways over this past year, and I'm so thankful for his faithfulness to my own personal family, to our church family, to our community, in spite of all the chaos that our world has been in. But I'll tell you, I would be lying if I told you that there haven't been days and even some stretches where I, I've you know, haven't felt deeply discouraged. And I know many of you can identify. Now, I'm a pretty positive guy most of the time. I'm a guy who tries to see the silver lining in things. And I'm, I may not always be a glass half full kind of guy, but I'm always at least a glass one third full kind of guy, right? So I'm pretty positive and I'm always going to look for ways that God is working in the midst of hard times. But I just have to be honest and tell you that I've had some rough days over the past year. And I know the same is true for so many of you. I know we have healthcare workers, for example, in our church and in our community who have seen things that have, that have even rattled them in spite of all their training. Uh, I, I know that we have many great law enforcement officers who feel dishonored and disrespected for being lumped into the negative category of a tiny few. I know we have small business owners who have been hanging on by a thread, often in the face of, of harassment and intimidation for merely fighting to survive. I know we have people seeking to confront racial injustice, and yet those who are legitimate and peaceful, obviously they're discouraged because they don't want to be lumped into the category of those who are creating havoc and violence. Um, we have people who are struggling with anxiety and depression related to COVID and the lockdowns and the isolation and the, the civil unrest. I know we have people suffering grief, very real grief, some even in our own church body over the loss of friends and loved ones. And I could just go on and on forever, but you get the point. We are living through a time when discouragement is on the rise and our need for encouragement is perhaps more critical than it's ever been in our generation. Generation. And again, encouragement is that art of building courage into one another. It's the consistent ministry of building one another up, coming alongside one another and reminding and reinforcing each other of the truth in a day when we are surrounded by so many lies. You know, just like the early believers in Thessalonica, you and I are living in a time when false teaching and lies just abound. We live in an age that we commonly refer to as the postmodern era, a time when absolute truth is under assault. And for many people, truth doesn't even exist. You know, we're living in a time much like what was described way back in the Old Testament book of Judges, chapter 17, where the nation of Israel is depicted by these words. Listen to this. It says in Judges 17, 6, in those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. 
Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. See, back in these days, there was no king, there was no righteous leader directing the people back to a standard of truth. And what happened? Well, as we just read, everyone did whatever they wanted to do. Everyone thought, what, whatever the, you know, the latest thing is, 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 whatever you want to do, just do it, right? It was just moral relativism. Doesn't that sound a little bit like the America we're living in today, we want to pretend that there is no divine order to things and that everyone can just create their own reality and whatever chaos uh, you know, happens to be based upon their feelings that this sort of flows from their actions, who cares what happens to anybody else, right? And this is one of many reasons we need to be about encouraging one another. There is something that the Bible talks about, it's known as the actual spiritual gift of encouragement. In other words, some people are endowed by the Holy Spirit with an unusually strong, we might call it an anointing in this area. But whether we have the actual gift of encouragement or not, we are all called to be encouragers. And you know, this past Wednesday... I was thinking back to my week that I just walked through. Um, you know, I, I, I'd woken up early to continue working on this message, actually, for this weekend on encouragement, and I got a text from a guy, a friend of mine, whose outdoor seating area at his restaurant had been decimated by the crazy wind and the rain on Tuesday night. And uh, it was actually the second tent that he had spent thousands of dollars to set up, and after this first one was destroyed by the wind. And, and, and all, you know, all this because people working in, in powers that be are telling us that indoor dining is prohibited unless, of course, the indoor dining is outdoors, then it's okay, right? So if you'll just indulge me for a moment, I'm, I'm not always the sharpest knife in the drawer, not a rocket scientist, don't claim to be, but I'm intelligent enough to know that something doesn't seem to add up when I'm told it's safe to eat inside a tent with propane heaters blaring and blasting and poor ventilation, but it's unsafe for me to eat inside a restaurant with OSHA-approved ventilation and state-of-the-art HEPA filters in use. But I digress, okay? Because again, I'm not an expert, so I'm just a layman, right? But my point is that as I looked at these, these photos of these piles of rubbish of this formerly, you know, beautiful outdoor seating area, the one that he had newly installed after the first one went down. My heart just sank for my friend because I'll tell you, these restaurant owners, along with many other business owners, salons, barbershops, gyms, other local retail stores and shops, they're being racked with burdensome mandates. Many of these places are already operating in the red. They've laid people off. They can't pay their bills. They're in debt up to their eyeballs and then stuff like this happens. So I'm writing this very sermon when I get this text and I see these four photos of this wreckage. And of course, it's a cold and rainy morning and my week is already so packed with appointments and deadlines and things going on. My birthday was coming up on Thursday and so I was kind of hoping that I, I could get things to work out in my schedule enough to, to be able to go home a little early on Thursday. And, and so I had every excuse in the book as to why I just kind of wanted to not deal with this and get my sermon finished. And that's really when I thought to myself, and maybe it was the Lord speaking to me saying, Jeremy, either you can sit there and write a sermon about encouraging people, or you can get up and go do it. And I knew what the Lord was speaking to my heart. So I, I put on my rain gear, and I jumped in my pickup, and I headed out to help my friend. A couple other guys ended up showing up, and so in a little over an hour, we were able to clean up and disassemble what would have taken one person all day to accomplish. But the point is, is that that is what encouragement is all about. It's, it's setting your own agenda aside enough to come alongside someone else who feels overwhelmed and remind them that they're not alone in their fight and that everything is going to be okay. So then, after we, you know, get done with that, I race home, I take a shower, and I run off to another appointment uh, that I had scheduled mid-morning, a coffee appointment with a guy, and, and as I'm talking with this other gentleman, uh, in the middle of that appointment, I get a call requesting to come to the hospital because Chaplain Ricardo is not doing well. And so, of course, I left for the hospital right away, and because of the gracious work of some folks uh, in the hospital who pulled some strings for us, I was able to go in and pray for Chaplain Ricardo with his daughter, Natalie. And, you know, because of the way uh, COVID has to be handled in the hospitals, this was the first time that I had actually been allowed uh, to come in and physically be with someone inside their room in 10 months. 
Um, you know, I, I think of how many families have had to say goodbye to loved ones who have not had any of their family or their pastor or their friends with them as they drew their final breaths. And I was just so grateful to be able to suit up with Natalie and to go into Ricardo's room and witness her being able to hold her dad's hand as he transitioned from earth to heaven. And I, I, I mention this experience with Natalie's permission. I mention this experience with Ricardo because, um, you know, not only because I know that some of you might be wondering, you know, what went down, but also because Chaplain Ricardo had the gift of encouragement about as strongly as I've ever seen in a person. When I say encouragement is about coming alongside someone to remind them that everything's going to be okay, I can hardly think of anyone who fits that description as well as Chaplain Ricardo. In fact, his life mantra, many of you could quote it with me, his life mantra was simply, all is well. All is well, right? Every time you saw him, how you doing, Ricardo? All is well. What's going on with your family, Ricardo? All is well. What's this? What's this? All is well. Didn't matter what was going on, all was well well with Ricardo. You know, I have a sign on my office door that Ricardo gave me after I returned from a mission trip to Kenya a few years ago. It says karibu, which is a word in Swahili that is roughly translated, all is well. I don't know where Ricardo stole that sign from, but I'm keeping it. So what, what exactly do we do when we feel discouraged? You know, it's a, it's a good question. One of the things that I love about serving as a pastor is that there's never a shortage of opportunity to be an encourager to people. People often open up to me about a lot of things, and often, you know, one of the most fundamental things they need in those moments is encouragement. But really, the truth of the matter is that's not just true for me as a pastor. You also have endless opportunities to encourage others. And I've discovered that often a great antidote to my own sense of personal discouragement is to look for ways to encourage someone else. We live in a world, man, I'll tell you, we live in a world of self-absorption, don't we? It seems that often the most natural thing we do is think about ourselves. It's why I love uh, how Jesus summarized the law of Moses with the words, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Because building courage into someone else with the same level of intensity with which we care for ourselves is actually getting us outside of ourselves enough to stop thinking only about ourselves, right? So in applying this one another of encouragement to the climate that we're living in today, I felt we could walk through a list of some of the most obvious ways we can do this right now. And then I'm going to just ask you to trust the Holy Spirit to lead you, and to, I'm going to do the same, to lead me in how we might find tangible, practical ways to put this into practice, to be encouragers in the week ahead and, of course, beyond. Because this isn't something we just do until the next sermon. This is something we walk in for the future until Jesus takes us home. So I mentioned a, a few categories of people earlier in my message, and I wanted to focus a little more deeply on those categories or those sectors of our culture right now. So look in your notes where it says, who and how can I encourage right now? Who and how can I encourage right now? And the first category, if you're a note taker like me, you can jot this down. The first category I want to mention are our frontline workers. Our frontline workers, medical and mental health professionals. You know, when the COVID-19 crisis hit almost a year ago, we obviously did not know much about this virus, certainly not near as much as we know now. And over the course of the past 10 months, some of our frontline workers have been exposed to things that even in their medical training, they, they couldn't have quite been prepared for. I've had the opportunity now to take a couple of visits to various ICU COVID wards, one to be with uh, Chaplain Ricardo, as I just mentioned, at North Bay a few days ago as he was getting ready to go to heaven. The other uh, had a doctor graciously uh, take me on a tour inside of Kaiser. And although, uh, you know, everyone's story is different in terms of how they respond and, and, and all of that, and just talking to some of these doctors and nurses along the way, you know, they're in a situation where there's this combination scenario of caring for people who are suffering from a very new and aggressive virus 
watching people die without their families by their side in most cases, handling the, the disagreements that exist sometimes even within the medical community about the best ways for handling and responding to and, and treating this virus, working mandatory overtime for long stretches in some cases, and just the list goes on and on. And I happen to think that our frontline workers are worthy of our encouragement at a time like this. So let's Again, let's be thinking about ways that we can encourage this sector of our community, those in our church, those throughout our region that God may put in our path. Could be anything from something as simple as taking time to thank them for their service, all the way to you know perhaps surprising them with some gift of appreciation or some other formal recognition. But whatever the Lord leads you to do, let's take time to recognize that this is a sector of our community that is under far more stress the normal right now, and let's find ways to build them and encourage them and build them up, build courage into them, really. So that's the first segment, our frontline workers. Secondly, let's find ways to encourage law enforcement. You know, as I already mentioned, so many people working in this field are just feeling dishonored and disrespected and lumped into a category of really a tiny handful of those who we would all agree should be held accountable whenever they abuse authority. But biblically, law enforcement, including the military, is affirmed by both Jesus and the apostles as a noble profession. And while no human system of justice is ever going to be perfect this side of heaven, in a fallen world, can you imagine a place where just anarchy is allowed to reign? I mean, no thinking person truly wants that. And while we must protect the right of people to peacefully express their views about what they believe to be needful reforms, the notion of calling for violence against those who protect us and keep us safe and at peace every day in our communities is just ludicrous to me. And I think it's ludicrous to the God who raised up positions of authority and accountability as we seek to implement them in our context today. You know, I, I, I think perhaps now more than ever in our lifetime, our law enforcement professionals need our encouragement. Are cops perfect? Of course not. No human being is perfect outside of Jesus, but the vast majority of those who take on this profession do so with great honor and integrity. And they deserve our, report, our support at a time when, when a vocal few are so hell-bent, it seems, on disrespecting the entire profession based on the accusations of a, and, and, and the actions of a, of a tiny handful. <clears throat> and... Um, I, I, just, I guess I'll just finish this point by saying that I want to say thank you to all of our law enforcement professionals who put their lives on the line willingly every time they put on that uniform and go to work. And I want you to know that I'm praying for you, I support you, and if there's ever anything that I can do for you personally or we can do for you as a church, please do not hesitate to reach out. Then another sector of people who need encouragement, number three, would be those who feel marginalized. You know, in spite of all the heated rhetoric, there are, actually are those who are trying to bring real change to real and perceived inequities in our culture. I, I preached about racism last week, and if you missed it, I encourage you to go back and, and listen to it. But, you know, unfortunately, those who, who participate in violence and destruction often drown out the voice of legitimate Folks who feel discriminated against and need to be heard and acknowledged and brought to the table for respectful debate, debate and, and conversation. Uh, as I stated last weekend, we, we cannot allow this us versus them cancel culture mentality of a sinful, broken world to deter us from seeking reconciliation wherever possible. The message of the gospel is by definition a message of reconciliation. Reconciliation between us and God and also us and others, one another. And so those of us who claim to follow Jesus, we need to be leading the way and making sure that we're not lumping legitimate voices into some generic category of rioters and looters and criminals. And so if you're aware of someone struggling, no matter whether you agree with everything they believe or not, politically, philosophically, religiously, let's look for ways to connect. Let's look for ways to listen, to empathize, to build trust. And as we do, not only will we be encouragers, but we may also end up being bridge builders. I've reached out to many of my fellow pastors of color, both brown and black, and uh, probably more so than I 
ever have over the past year, to talk with them, to learn from them, to get a sense of perhaps where my own blind spots are so that I can be a greater influence for reconciliation moving forward. Then a fourth sector that I believe heavily needs our encouragement right now are our small business owners. As I mentioned already, we have a lot of local restaurants, gyms, salons, retail shops that have been deemed non-essential for various reasons. And the fact of the matter is, and I think we should all agree that <coughs> every single job is essential. We should understand that every lawful endeavor that puts food on the table and keeps roofs over heads is essential. And it baffles me that we're still even having to state the obvious on this matter. You know, back in March and April and May, we were all very willing to scale back and to pump the brakes and to make some sacrifices as we were trying to get a handle on how this new virus would affect our country and the world. And I'm just wondering if any of us still remember the, you know, 15 days to flatten the curve. That seems like ancient history. Here we are almost a year later expecting people to keep operating on a small fraction of their income, unable to pay their rent, uh, to get their employees back to work, to put food on their own tables in some cases. There are many hundreds already, hundreds of businesses in our county alone who have shut their doors forever, and these small businesses need our encouragement. In fact, I can give you some practical ideas by directing you to a group that I've personally been involved with. It's called Unite Solano. If you go to their website, unitesolano.org, you can find a list, a growing list of local businesses who you can support by patronizing them and finding other small ways to encourage them. You can call into the county supervisors and the city council and speak your mind respectfully to our leaders. You can write letters of support in terms of reopening sales. Safely, because it's long past time that we, we stop buying into the false dichotomy that the only thing we, we can do is, is choose between either caring for the sick or getting people back to work. I've been saying it for months, it's not an either or, it is a both and. And this is the United Stinking States of America and we can do it better than we've been doing it. In fact, this weekend, we have some Solano County shirts, or Unite Solano shirts, rather, available for purchase. If you'd like to support this coalition, if you're watching online, uh, you can go to UniteSolano.org and order them from the, the website. Uh, but yeah, you can do it there or live on our campus, however you choose. Incidentally, one other free and practical way that you can help is by going to Yelp or Facebook, you know, social media, or Google, and giving, or all of them, and giving these businesses five-star positive reviews if, in fact, you believe them to be good businesses. I'm not telling you to lie, but if you've gone there and you've received good service and good products, then talk about it, because there's unfortunately been a wave of people who are anti-reopening, and they've been flooding Yelp and social media to give bad reviews to businesses that they don't even shop with anyway. And, you know, we can help turn that tide in a small way by flooding these small businesses with great reviews. You can do that to churches around the area as well. You know, Valley Church has had a couple of reviews the last couple of weeks uh, where one person said something along the lines of, we're an anti-mask wearing cult. And, you know, not only are we not anti-mask wearing, we're certainly not a cult, um, but people who won't even reach out to me or anyone here personally will just, you know, we live in a world where we have this power where everybody thinks they have a megaphone in their hand and they can just destroy and say whatever they want. So I encourage you, if you've never given Valley a five-star review, go to our Facebook page, go to Yelp, go to Google, and do that as well. So those are just small ways that don't cost any money, just a little bit of time to, you know, encourage Fifthly, we need to encourage folks who are struggling with mental health issues. People struggling with mental health, you know, anxiety, depression, they're some of the very real and unintended consequences of the isolation that has been created by these lockdowns and other cultural distresses over the past 10 months. People who have never even traditionally struggled with mental illness are finding it very difficult to press through the onslaught and the negativity and bad news. And that's not to mention the increase of child abuse and domestic violence and other consequences that are overwhelming our law enforcement and our county services and agencies right now, according to what the head of HS HSS and our chief of police have personally told me. These are, you know, many ways, there are so many ways that we can reach out and encourage, build courage into folks who are struggling. Obviously, we can be praying for folks. That's where we need to start. But beyond that, we can start by simply reaching out, asking if they're okay. 
offering to pray, offering to talk, offering to listen, and even directing them to resources where they can find help. You know, a lot of times there are, these are great opportunities really to point people to the hope of the gospel. They don't yet know Christ because ultimately Jesus is the only cure for these ills that we are seeing so broadly on display throughout our society. And then finally, I'll mention the need to encourage those who have suffered great loss. Those who have suffered loss. I'm speaking, of course, primarily about those who have lost loved ones or close friends uh, who have died from or with COVID-19 or or whatever other, perhaps, ailments uh, that, that have taken them recently. These families haven't Many times, no matter how people have uh, passed away, many times nobody's really allowed to memorialize their loved ones or be with their loved ones on their last final journey from this earth to heaven. Um, uh, funeral homes are, are limiting attendance, and, and, and it's just a very difficult time to lose someone right now. Very difficult time to say goodbye to our loved ones over the past many months due to the restrictions that have placed great... Um, Uh, you know, a great weight and burden on the way that we normally do things. I was so, as I said, I was so thankful that Natalie was able to hold Chaplain Ricardo's hand as he breathed his last and went to be with Jesus this past Wednesday. Not many opportunities like that are being given right now. And while my heart breaks for Every family who has had to say goodbye to their loved ones from a distance or via video or in some other crude form of communication, the reason I was so thankful to be with Natalie by Ricardo's side this week is because here's a man, here's a man who's invested literally decades of his life holding the hands of untold hundreds of people in hospitals, nursing homes, living rooms, bedrooms as they were preparing to meet Jesus. And the idea that Chaplain Ricardo might not be afforded that same opportunity was just such a painful thing to consider. It was a prospect that just seemed so unfair to me, so unjust to me. And I was just praying, Lord, open a door. And of course, the Hedrick family, to, to, you know, to, to think of how they're having to grapple with moving ahead now with life on earth without Mike. The Mango family, uh, who moved to Oklahoma just uh, last year, but are suffering the loss of Joe, who spent so much of his time investing in children's ministry and men's ministry here at Valley. We have other friends throughout our community and in the hospital that are battling to fight through. And I just want to, I want to find every opportunity we can to build courage, to come alongside, to be of help to those who are suffering the loss or the the illness of a loved one at a time when life just seems so out of whack in general. So as we conclude for today, I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by any of this, as though I'm giving you some sort of a checklist that you've got to go out and accomplish this week. What I'm asking you to do is to join me as the Lord leads you, the Holy Spirit prompts you in your day-to-day life to, to join me in becoming an instrument of encouragement in the life of others in this time when discouragement seeks to win the day. Because I'll tell you what, it will not win the day. That's a declaration I just want to make by the power and authority of Jesus Christ. Discouragement will not win the day. How do I know? Because discouragement is from the enemy, and the enemy is defeated at the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, that's what this new life, that's what this new covenant, this new community is all about. Life in Christ begins with simple faith in Him. In a moment, the band is going to come and lead us in a closing song, but I do not want to pass up on this opportunity to ask you whether or not you've ever considered, you know, if I were to be the one that exited this life and headed into the next, do I, do I have that figured out? Do I know where I would go? Do I have a relationship with Jesus Christ? I'll close with a brief story. As I was standing there, at first on the outside of Chaplain Ricardo's ICU room, Natalie had suited up ahead of me and she was allowed to go in and stand by her father. And as I was out there on the outside, there was another glass window in the next room over and I saw a gentleman laying face down with prison tattoos all over his back. The the sheets were up uh, up to his waist but his back was bare and he had 
prison tattoos all over him that would look like prison tattoos to me. And I saw prison guards there, and so I began to chat with them. And I asked these gentlemen, you know, hey, everything okay? And they start to tell me that this guy uh, is number 10 in the Mexican mafia, and that he's been in prison for many years, and that he is uh, suffering with COVID and is uh, struggling to, you know, go on in life. And it was so incredible to stand there and to see this dichotomy, to see Chaplain Ricardo in this room facing up, this man lying face down with evidence of the life that he had chosen all over him. And I'm not talking, you know, I'm not again, I, I think tattoos are awesome. I'm just saying his arrangement uh, was, was, you know, evidence of where he'd been in life. And the Lord, as, as I was looking at these two men on their deathbeds, it was like the Lord brought this vision of Pilate standing there between Jesus and Barabbas. And Pilate comes out and he, he tells the chanting crowd, hey, you tell me who you want to release and I'll release them and we'll, we'll, you can condemn the other one. And he thinks it's going to be a no-brainer because Barabbas is such a filthy, rotten criminal. He thinks the people are going to say, okay, release Jesus, we'll kill Barabbas. But no, they yell, we want Barabbas to go free. And Jesus, the innocent one, is the one who's going to be crucified. And then over only hours later, then I saw, it's like the Lord took me to the cross and there's Jesus again this time between two thieves. He's got the thief on one side that mocks him and says, hey, if, if you're really the savior of the world, why don't you get to save us all? And there's a guy on the other side that says, Jesus, remember me when you enter into your father's kingdom. And we see that arrogance and that humility. And in those moments of, of standing there looking at Chaplain Ricardo and this other gentleman, it was like the Lord spoke to me and said, Jeremy, I love both of those men with the same level of intensity. I love both of them, not based on what they've done, but because they're created in my image and I died for them. And as I was thinking about their, and I'm not judging this man's soul, obviously he could have received Christ in prison or whatever, I'm not, that's, that's for God to figure out. But what I am saying is, if indeed Ricardo was just about to enter heaven and this man was just about to enter judgment, I know Ricardo would be the first one to say, I didn't get to heaven because I lived a better life. I got to heaven because Jesus rescued me from my sin by his grace. That is the gospel. That is the message that we're here to proclaim. And I don't care who you identify with more. You might identify more with Chaplain Ricardo, someone who's loved Jesus for many years, served him with all your heart, and, and you know, you're ready to meet your maker. Or you might identify with the other man. Maybe you're ashamed of some things in your past. Maybe you're not sure if you were to be required to stand before God right now, what he would have to say to you. Well, you can be sure today. And as our band comes forward to lead us in a closing song, I'm just gonna bow in prayer and ask you to join me if you'd like to receive new life, just to join me in praying this prayer from your heart of hearts. Just reach out and say, God, I need you. I realize that having a relationship with you is not about living a perfect life. It's about trusting a perfect Savior. And I want to be like Chaplain Ricardo when my number's called. I want to be able to stand before you with my head held high. And when you look me in the eyes, to hear you say, and for my heart to rejoice in the reality that all is well. So I believe in what you did on the cross for me. I believe that you rose from the dead for me. And that based upon that sacrifice and that resurrection, I can have new life, eternal life. And so I receive that new life. Come into me. 
by your spirit and live within me. Make me a brand new person. Put to death that old self and raise a new self in the image of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. These things I pray in your precious holy name. Amen. Well, if you're watching online or in the video venue, I'd ask you if you prayed that prayer for the first time to please reach out to me. You can email me at jwhite, it's my first initial and last name, jwhite at valleychurch.com and just let me know, hey, Pastor Jeremy, I prayed that prayer to receive Christ. If you'll leave me a way to get back in touch with you, your phone number or some other means to, to get in contact with you, I'd love to call you back and chat with you and welcome you to the family, give you a Bible if you need a Bible and just help you in any way that I can start taking those first baby steps on this journey with Jesus. Valley Church, thank you so much for tuning in this weekend. I love you. I'm so thankful to be your pastor. I'll be back up for one final closing word in a moment. For the time being, continue to stay with us and let's worship.